Well, hello and welcome to the Sense Making the Changing World show. Uh, this is our special urban agriculture uh, feature. And each week during Urban Agriculture Month, uh, we're speaking with someone who's doing amazing work in some part of Australia. And today I'm speaking with Amanda Collins and Amanda runs Backyard Bees Ballarat with her partner, Scott Denno. Um, she's also involved in Green Fork Urban farming which donates to projects like second bite and is is an urban beekeeper of multiple talents for and multiple projects what i'm hearing and reading so welcome so much to the show it's an absolute delight to have you here amanda thanks moreg i'm really really excited to to speak with you today so tell me first up how and why did you get into beekeeping urban beekeeping in particular because you know um bringing bees into the urban area is not always kind of like the first thing that you think about doing. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we actually moved um, into an urban setting so that we could actually nurture our love and passion for our bees and urban beekeeping. So we used to live uh, kind of in a peri-urban area just outside Ballarat underneath Mount Bunnyong. Um, on 10 acres and it was at it was at that point in yeah that point in our lives that uh, one of Scott's uh, colleagues actually needed a place for a hive to go for a for a period of time and uh, we said that was fine to have this hive located um, in our back paddock we had some like um, Wilshire horn sheep down there and some um, alpacas and we thought yep that'll be fine and then there was this slow kind of evolution of, oh, oh, bees. Oh, we better find out more about them. Oh, okay. So we kind of started this really in-depth process and, and learning um, how to be beekeepers. We um, were really fortunate to come across a, um, a retired um, commercial beekeeper who was so generous with his time to be able to mentor us. And we kind of went through this kind of speed learning process, um, not just on beekeeping, but on botany and, um, you know, um, uh, in, insects more broadly, birds, um, all sorts of um, kind of broader issues and information. And from that, uh, we kind of, our hives, number of our hives increased, other people became interested. And then we decided um, that probably all the other things we had going on in our like 10 acre um, kind of little um, farm, like our sheep and, <laughs> and, you know, lots of fruit trees and all those kind of things, we actually wanted to dedicate more time to beekeeping. So we kind of uh, sold our small property and we moved into inner city Ballarat. So right in Ballarat Central in one of kind of the more old historic type streets um, with the bluestone gutters and the beautiful plane trees. It potentially is the ugliest house in the street. It's the 1980s, uh, late 80s brick veneer house. Um, and I love the kind of history of the house because there was an elderly Greek couple who used to live here. And um, unfortunately, they both passed away. But we understand from the neighbours, they had an amazing, lush vegetable garden and fruit trees. And um, when we kind of explored the, the back area of the property more, there was evidence of um, kind of a bit of a terracing type um, <laughs> configuration to the backyard. And there was irrigation and there was all sorts of fantastic infrastructure um, you know, an old chook shed, all those kind of things. But unfortunately, the, the son, um, once his parents had passed away, decided it would be better for renters to um, not have access to all these kind of fantastic things. So he essentially came through and demolished everything in the backyard. So we have one fruit tree, one very old but not very big, I have to say, um, apple tree in our backyard that we kept and were very protective of when we did some backyard works. Um, so that's kind of like the legacy tree for our somewhat unattractive house in the street, but that's our legacy tree. Um, and we kind of built around that um, for um, what we've done in our backyard. So, yeah, our hives are... Um, in different locations around Ballarat. So we've now got around 80 beehives, um, 
but we're still considered in the big in the big scheme of things very very small in terms of beekeeping terms and we prefer to keep it that way so when you say you've got them scattered around so you manage the hives but they're in different people's backyard gardens is that how it's working yeah, so um, there's a number of different options. Um, we've got, um, we do have, well, we kind of call them, um, they're almost like sentinel hives and we kind of have hives in different locations to get a sense of where there might be a honey flow happening um, and where the best, you know, kind of forage is available for, for bees. Um, so we have those. We also have really good networks with other local beekeepers who tell us, you know, about, you know, where, where things are happening. And, of course, we share that information when we find there might be a honey flow somewhere as well. Um, so can we just stop there and say, what is a honey flow? Uh, so, so a honey flow in, a, in an urban setting could be um, something like where there might be some native, um, you know, kind of remnant um, native vegetation. There might be a cluster of, say, they might even be man planted like yellow box or red gums or um, along the kind of um, a meandering creek um, where they're all these, you know, beautiful um, uh, um, native um, trees might be flowering. It might be a cluster, it might be a cluster around the Ballarat Botanic Gardens where lots of things are flowering at once. So it's interesting that, you know, like you're from a from a beekeeper's perspective, uh, a preponderance of flowering of native plants is called a honey flow. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I'm, I always think about it from the from the trees' perspective, and you're looking from the bees' perspective. That's yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I know it is a little bit weird like that, but um, being in an urban setting is is often um, easier to keep bees, particularly in established areas. Um, Why is that? Well, it's that? mainly because of the, um, well, there's a couple of things. You've got the, in terms of bees being a little bit warmer because you've got that kind of um, um, thermal, thermal mass. urban mass. Yeah. Yep. So you've got that that you have in kind of established areas. You've also generally got really good established um, floral resources. Mm. So um, unlike um, greenfield areas or new estates where things are just getting going and often some of the vegetation which has been or put in or landscaped by land developers is not particularly uh, friendly to any pollinators. Um, it, 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 you know, being in an established area or being in a peri-urban area, which um, kind of bounds onto like a, a regional um, park or, you know, something that, or, or river or a creek, something that just, you know, kind of fosters that kind of natural vegetation is really good for bees, much like weeds as well. And often you get that as well. What are the threats to bees in an urban area? Yeah, see, um, probably the, the biggest threat is, to be honest, is us people <laughs> and um, for a number of reasons one is our use of um, kind of neonicotinoid based products so people who are quite fastidious sometimes about maintaining um, their lawn and removing any weeds um, and making sure that you know they kind of have a very well structured kind of um, I guess English style garden um, we have as I mentioned we've got the the situation with um you know, new estates and land developers are not keen to put in um, plants that are um, but potentially, you know, yield lots of pollen and nectar and have, you know, um, broader benefits uh, for pollinators. Um, people in general, so humans, in terms of how they actually manage bees and their beehives, um, and sometimes that can be problematic because particularly in an urban setting, um, and just general um, kind of um, habitat destruction, once again, from humans again. So th there's, there are quite a number of, you know, threats really for urban beekeepers. And how do you manage um, people's fear of bees or, you know, legitimate fears if people have, you know, allergies to bees? Like how do you manage that in an urban population? Yeah, look, what we do is that... Um, we generally recommend that um, people find out from their neighbours if they have any strong adverse kind of reactions to um, to um, being stung by a bee. But in general, what happens, the gift of honey um, during, you know, spring and summer is, is, is fantastic in terms of having that ability to share with your neighbours. 
we're really uh, in an unusual situation that we, because of the unusual nature of our kind of urban block, we've got seven neighbours. So um, when when somebody new moves in, we go and, you know, have a chat to them and let them know about, you know, that we've got some beehives. Yeah, and, oh, and here's some honey. So yes. that's always a really good introduction. Most people we come across are fascinated by yeah, bees. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. everything about them and... And often neighbours will pop in when we've got a hive open and, you know, they might just stick on a veil and have a look as well. So yeah. it's like bring people in. Yeah, nice. Yeah. I wonder what type of hives do you have? Do you have a diversity of different types of hives or which ones do you find easiest for people to manage in an urban environment or with, you know, multiple levels of skill? Yeah. Not everyone's an yeah. expert beekeeper like you. Yeah, look, sure. We've got, we, um, we're just, we're, Beekeeping is a lifelong journey and no one will ever know it all. But the bee, the um the hives that we have in our backyard are just traditional Langstroth hives. So they're eight frame Langstroth hives and we use um, ideal honey supers. So they're, they're much smaller um, and they're easy to manage from a, um, a kind of a lifting perspective because once those honey supers are full with frames and honey and honeycomb, they become quite, um, ch you know, challenging to lift. And one of the reasons that we, you know, made these kind of choices was really about we want to be in this um, in this space for a long time. So we thought about, you know, longevity in beekeeping, what best suits us. Um, our hives are raised off the ground and that's just another kind of ease of um, being able to, you know, look at your, your brood frames and um, harvest your honey. I've just um, got a long Langstroth hive, which has been made by a local beekeeper. Um, and I'm so keen to like get that set up and that that'll be like, we, you know, we know like to plan these things ahead. So it'll be just outside our chook pen. Um, so when our girls are free ranging, they can they can um, eat the dead bees that fall out the front of the hive. So it's like a full cycle of wow, that's so cool. So yeah, well, and I I wonder too. There's a whole lot of other equipment that you need in beekeeping, and I wonder instead of everyone who's got like a single hive in their backyard or just a couple, do you have anything set up that means people can? share that kind of processing equipment or how do they do that how do you um, look that's a little bit tricky because of um honeybee biosecurity oh. so you you so there's a number of um kind of endemic diseases and pests that we need to to deal with and they're often spread by humans again from hive to hive and that means that the equipment that you use really needs to be contained to the apiary that you're working on um so uh Things like varroa destructor that you might have heard about recently, the mite, the invasive exotic mite that's um, quite, um, you know, there's um, issues happening in New South Wales, which we hope are contained now. But there's there's other, um, I guess, uh, um, diseases like American fowl brood, which is spread, often spread on equipment. And the spores of this particular disease can last for up to 50 years. So sharing equipment, and protective gear is is really problematic yeah okay yeah so what do you need as a basic beekeeper in a backyard like to be able to set up your hive you know say in a little urban permaculture backyard garden you've got yeah. your bees what else do you need yeah, so look, we generally suggest people do a few kind of key things when they want to get started. One is to just check your backyard and make sure there's an appropriate location because um, often people want to squish a beehive into a really tiny space that might be down this side of their house. It gets no sun during the day or alternatively it might be like they want to put it in their direct and constant path to the rubbish bin or the clothesline. So, so you need to So what are those principles of locating? Yeah, so sun and yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we generally say morning sun, um, and that's just like us. As humans, we'd like to get a little bit warm to get going during the day. So, yeah, morning sun um, is great, um, away from any of your kind of normal activity areas where you normally pass by because you don't really want to be walking through the flight path of your bees all the time. Yeah. Um, they find that a hassle, and you'll find a hassle if you get sun yeah. <laughs> regularly by walking. <laughs> by walking through their flight path. Um, that's one of the, the key things. Um, beekeeping can be as expensive or as economical as you like. 
Um, so, you know, there's the minimum things you need to do, which are making sure that um, you're registered with your um, Department of Primary Industries um, in Victoria, to Agriculture Victoria. And that's just really around biosecurity and making sure that they know where the hives are just from a bio biosecurity perspective. Um, the other things are really, if you've got a local bee club, connect with them, a beekeeping association or group, connect with them or other beekeepers, they often have courses. So we generally recommend people who want to get started in beekeeping, just do a basic level introduction course and then connect with their local bee club. They'll get some, you know, kind of ongoing support and um, um, if there's capacity mentoring as well. Um, and then at this time of the year, we've got lots of swarm activity happening. Um, so we're getting call outs quite regularly around swarms. So for members of the public who um, see a swarm, we're trying to educate um, or provide some education about what a swarm looks like, where it might be, and don't just stress, don't stress out about it. Just contact your local beekeeper or your beekeeping club because when swarms are in that kind of formation, they're generally most docile. Um, so don't go hosing them or trying to move them, move them on. Just ring a beekeeper and they will come and simply, um, you know, put them into a box and then come back later that night and, um, and uh, yeah, remove them. And that is the start of a new colony of bees. Yeah. So, yeah, great. Yeah. So you, as well as doing your own beekeeping, like, I mean, there's a few questions I want to ask you around this. One is around like, what do you do with all your honey? Is that like a business that you have? And is that something that other people are learning how to do through you as well? Like is, is urban beekeeping a livelihood possibility? Can you do that? Um, uh, so yes and no. People are very keen to get um, local honey which is great. And our hives are currently located along the Yarrawee River, which, um, which we um, borrow this tract of land from the Crown. Um, and so it means that in Golden Point, we've got a prolific kind of access to really good local um, honey supplies. Um, generally, people get into urban beekeeping because they want to supply themselves and their immediate family and friends. Um, if you live in a peri, more of a peri-urban kind of area, there is the possibility of um, producing larger quantities of honey. But generally what we find is um, uh, if you're selling honey in particular, you need to have the ability to provide um, kind of continuity of supply. And that is really problematic if you're an urban beekeeper because having that, it's because beekeeping is so seasonal. And we try to, um, we also try and like, you know, let people know that beekeeping is a seasonal, much like fruits and vegetables and any other product. Beekeeping is very seasonal. So, um, so when so for people listening, when is the when is the flushest time yeah. of honey? Yeah. Product? So um, spring, summer, and early autumn. So that's kind of the period. Um, and then during those kind of very cold winter months and during early spring, particularly set in South Australia, like um, we are here in Victoria, um, yeah, the bees go into a pack down phase where they essentially um, eat the honey, the capped honey that's already in their hive that they've made during those um, other months, um, during the kind of, you know, prolific months of honey flow. Um, and they will eat that um, honey. So we are so, you know, we're so um, grateful that when we see them coming out through the other end and they're still healthy and strong and they've made it through winter, which is generally an issue for mainly Victorians and, you know, Tasmanians as well um, because of the cold conditions. Um, we are just, you know, we just feel so grateful that they've made it through. Um, and yeah, just we've got a micro business. In fact, it could also be, it could be even smaller than a micro business. So yeah, back our beekeeping Ballarat, we produce some um, um, honey and we also work with another beekeeper who is uh, very close to us um, and access different honey supplies from them. And that's really just to provide our customers with um, some different types of honey that they might prefer. So um, different honeys have different flavours and textures and crystallisation rates and all those kind of things. So, um, yeah, we supply to local cafes um, and restaurants and um during COVID in particular, we noticed that there was a lot of our local cafes were also setting up as like pantries and larders. 
and honey was one of their go-to um, kind of products for people. And, um, you know, we it was just an amazing time during COVID because people had such a, a really horrible time during COVID. Our business actually flourished during that period. Um, I can imagine with the- Honey, yeah. comfort, I don't know. Yeah. And we also set up an um, a, a old school locker in the front of our house, um, which was, um, you know, kind of um, click and collect, kind of um, easy, urban, um, kind of, you know, urban um, way to actually collect your honey without having any contact. And it worked really, really well. What sort of, um, can you describe the flavour or colour of your honey? Is it like one of the dark ones or it is a light yeah. one? What is it? What so we've got a few it? varieties at the moment. Um, so we've got Yellow Box, which is from Central Victoria. It's a really light, it's quite a sweet honey. Um, it probably has less flavour than some of our honeys, but we kind of describe it as the traditional tea and toast honey. Yeah. So um, it's kind of got a very nostalgic kind of um uh, vibe to it so a lot of our customers who are older people who or enjoyed honey um, in regional or rural Victoria will often be very well acquainted with yellow box um, so we've got that one we've got um, some beautiful banksia so some banksia honey old um, old man banksia it's a really dark rich um, honey um, generally described for people bold flavors if people are really into like a lot more flavor and less sweetness um, then that's a terrific honey. So any of those kind of stringy bark or banksia type um, honeys are, are much bolder in their flavours. Excellent for, you know, if you want to um, yeah, cooking, your banana cakes, any of those kind of, you know, kind of rich flavours. You're not watering listening to you. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. And it's just so yummy and we love honey. What, with them? Um, sorry, I was just going to enjoy when you do you have any that come from Grevillea? Because I always go along the Grevillea yeah. flowers and cut the nectar and lick that. There's like this caramel flavor, there's floral yeah. flavors, all different flavors of the nectar. Do you does that come through into the honey? Do you um so yeah, the flavors so um honey, much like um wine, they actually now have honey sommeliers. So um there's two you can train in either Italy or the US to become a honey sommelier sommelier. There's an international like um society of honey sommeliers. Wow, um, I think I might like to sign up for that. I know. <laughs> and much like what you were just describing in terms of having those kind of um you know, those kind of different flavour profiles, much like wine, they also exist in honey. Mm -hmm. And often um, um, there'll be discussion around, you know, the terroir and where where the honey's actually or where the plant has actually been, um, is located mm -hmm. and the kind of location and it, it, you know, it becomes very kind of complex, but it's much like wine tasting. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So what... So from year to year, say, when there's like a, a drought or a flood or do you notice a change in honey consistency and flavour? Uh, yeah, often there is. So it depends. There's a few things that happen kind of climatically and the changes that we've seen um, from, you know, the kind of conversations we have had with um, older beekeepers that is the one of the first things you notice, there just won't be any. So um, there's some honey varieties that because of the climatic changes that we're having are just not flowering and we just don't have access to them anymore. And they're really changing in terms of the seasonality of the honey. So when, for instance, the eucalypts are flowering, it's much different. It's harder to understand and judge and kind of read. Um, so, yeah, but um, in general, the honey flavour in some ways stays reasonably similar in terms of because they often have um, honey competitions as well. So you need to make sure that, you know, your red gum does taste like a red gum, but there's so many seasonal and local variations to those kind of things. It really is you know, very localised yeah. kind of flavours. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's just there's a whole world in this that you don't really think about yeah. until you're deeply in it. And I, I wanted to ask you a little bit too about the impact of, say people using urban chemicals because I know like if you take the beehives out into the rural areas that have yeah. chemicals used that that, that yes. also affects yes honey. what about yeah. in in urban areas and how do you address that 
Well, that's really tricky because um, it's once again getting to know your neighbours and uh, you kind of want to identify if somebody does have that very pristine uh, weed-free lawn um, in your immediate area and just get a sense of their like gardening practices and whether or not they're likely to use those kind of products. Um, the, the honey, once again, taking them some honey and just talk to them about how it might impact on the bees and other pollinators and other insects. Um, that's really important. But also talk to them about if they um, want to continue to use um, herbicides or pesticides, then the best time to do that. So that's like on a wind-free day, you know, when all late at later at night. So when all your forager bees are back in the hive, so they're less likely to be foraging. Um, so to reduce the risk of that that kind of poisoning event because it does happen. Yeah. yeah. And how far from your hive do your bees travel in that kind of context? Is it 300 metres or so you're looking or? Yeah, yeah. look, um, bees are a little bit like us. So if they need to, I just described as if they need to go and get a, a litre of milk, they'll go, what is the closest that I need to go to get what I need? And bees are exactly the same. So I'll go, well, I'll just go to the milk bar. So if they find the forage that they want and they prefer at the milk bar or two houses away, they will exhaust that supply. Yeah. Um, they, will they will do the waggle dance. They'll tell all their other foragers, you know, where the forage is, how far it is, all those kind of, you know, important information if you're a bee, and they will exhaust that um, forage um, until it's gone. Then they'll go, you know, there's no milk left or nectar or pollen left in that particular <laughs> milk bar will have to go to the uh, local supermarket so then they'll go to their next second favorite forage source and the, the whole colony will you know hang around there and they'll actually you know forage until they finish that and they'll just keep moving out until they till they find you know that they're, they're potentially you know exhausted all the resources but generally we say people look bees will look bees have been known to forage up to 10 kilometers away from their hive that's but amazing. we normally say around three to five. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but mostly as close as possible. As close as possible. Because you wouldn't want to be out. going out and trying to talk to everyone within a five-kilometre radius of your house. That's right, <laughs> yes. So, like, immediate, <laughs> immediate, like, yes, do the best that you can. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So around this whole bee hive mind and waggle dance, can you speak to some of those sort of things that, that happen and what are the most extraordinary things about that whole beehive mind that you've discovered? Yeah, so the even though you know in a um in a group or a colony within a, a beehive you might have maybe 60,000 bees. I find this whole bee behavior thing quite fascinating. So even though there might be 60,000 individual insects in that colony when they make a decision, they make it as a hive, they make it as a colony, and that's where the notion of hive mind comes from. So, you know, you, you're, you're operating as one organism. But within that organism, all the bees, based on their different ages and stages, will have a different role. They will have very prescribed roles within the hive, um, you know, starting from um, the, the very first role, which is, um, you know, um, uh, helping some of their um, sisters uh, get out of the cell when they've just been born and clean a bee so they'll have it and they'll turn around that the bee that's just been born will just turn around and clean their own cell out and make it ready for another egg to be laid in that particular cell. So the roles are quite diverse. Um, you know, there's nurse bees, forager bees, um, housekeeper bees, which I think are just fascinating. So you might accidentally drop a very small uh, I don't know, a very like a really small item in, into the hive. So I don't know, let's say a piece of string, a piece of cotton or something, and you will actually see the housekeeper bees manipulate that, if particularly if you've got a window in your hive, manipulate that um, and actually bring it out and turf it out the door. <laughs> so it's it's just fascinating. Yeah. And of course, there's talking about things that get thrown out the door, dead bees as well. Um, so, yeah, those kind of undertaker bees take dead bees out and throw them out the door. There's sentry how, bees. How, that, how long do bees live for? Um, it really depends on the season. Um, so during um, winter they have a longer um, lifespan because they're not working 
as hard as they would if they were during, you know, spring and summer. So during the peak kind of periods, six to seven weeks when they're really working hard. Yeah. Um, and you can often, uh, if you find a bee or if you see a bee on a flower or whatever, have a look because you'll be able to get a general sense of the age of the bee by how much fur it has in the body. Oh. So the least amount of fur means that the bee is older. Oh, wow. um, so you can get a sense of that. And also have a look if you're looking close up on the um, the wing, the bee's wings. So if they're tatty, it means they've been, they're older and they've been flying for a while as well. Isn't this fascinating then too that, you know, such a structured social context there, but yet the, the lives of the individuals are so short, but yet that yes. memory of the wholeness yes. remains, the patterns yes. of connection remain. I know it's amazing. I find the whole concept, that's the things that probably most fascinates me about beekeeping. It's less about the honey, to be honest. We like actually for both Scott and I, it's less it's, honey is like just a, a fantastic byproduct of being able to work with bees. Being in love with the bees, yeah. Yeah, and observe them. And we're both, I guess, keen observers. And you know, when you get your head stuck in a hive, you just constantly want to work out what are they doing? Trying to understand and find meaning. Yeah, from what the bees are actually doing. Yeah, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. I, I teach systems thinking with, with youth and maybe like actually getting them into hives because that yeah. explains exactly the whole approach to systems thinking, you know, what you just described there. So, oh, my gosh. Have yeah, you- it's, it's fascinating. Bee behaviour is just absolutely, you know, and then the preparation for swarming. So the whole like notion of like, oh, the whole, you know, even though they've got their individual um roles um they'll all be going yeah okay they'll, so there'll be a, a a collective decision made around yeah with the outgrown of our space we need to find a new home we need to replicate ourselves and they will decide uh, based on weather conditions and how many resources they've got and it's just a, a fascinating uh, process really yeah. swarming and, and then you you run program, you run workshops with people, but I also noticed when I was sort of reading your site that you run programs uh, for people with mental illness or yeah. there's this idea of therapeutic beekeeping. Yes. Like tell us about that and what you've yeah. noticed about what happens when people start working with bees. Yeah, we set up um, Hive Mind Community Apri um, a couple of years, pre, pre the pandemic, um, a couple of years ago, based on um, some information that we'd seen on in a couple of locations. One was on Gardening Australia, um, and um, it talked about kind of the, the value in beekeeping from a therapeutic perspective for people who'd returned from um, active military service. And the other one was a... Um, a a project which which had been happening or was happening and continues to happen in Canada called Highs for Humanity. Um, and they had set up a social enterprise around um, helping people to use beekeeping um, and some of the other um, valuable skills that you learn around beekeeping um, to actually help people in a complementary kind of therapeutic um, way. So we set up Hive Mind Community Apri um, with a number of other kind of partners Um, to actually see whether this would be something that could help or be useful in like a local context. So um, we're into our second season now since since COVID got in the way. Um, And we've had a number of people go through the course and continue on as beekeepers afterwards. And, uh, yeah, the, the notion is for if you've had a, a lived, a current or a lived experience with um, mental ill health, but in particular depression, loneliness, isolation, those kind of things, um, then we have a what we call a season of beekeeping. So the current, we're doing a current program at the moment, which takes you from some theory and some practical experience right through to really um, developing um, foundation skills to be able to become um, a confident beekeeper at the end. Um, so it's it's a really fantastic program and there's a number of other um, kind of offshoots which are happening, I know, around Australia. There's, um, there's one specifically which has been set up for military veterans as well. Um, as well. So it's um, just some really useful benefits from a social kind of and community connection perspective. Yeah, yeah. So you're, an, you're a nurse and... And you work with with council as well, is that right? So, do you see this 
type of approach to engaging in urban agriculture, whether it be beekeeping or gardening, being embraced at that level, whether it be in the health field or in the local government community health field? Yeah, definitely. I now work for um, um, community health here in Ballarat and um, we're really looking at how we could um, make some positive impacts and use alternative ways to connect with people and not just from um, kind of that um, kind of physical, so there's such physical components to gardening, beekeeping, connecting with people, but also from mental health perspective as well. Um, and they're kind of overcoming some of those um, issues around social isolation and people's lack of connection as well. And the co-benefits around um, um, helping people to learn skills to do um, gardening and uh, food production. So one of the areas I work in um, in community health is around healthy food. Um, so, um, you know, kind of um, upskilling or supporting people to be able to grow just some really, even if it's one or two things, that they can grow at home, um, that they have some success with, and then potentially, you know, kind of excite them and inspire them to take a deep dive into, oh, maybe I could extend this and think about these, you know, kind of other factors as well. So, um, you know, the co-benefits around climate change as well, really awesome in terms of, you know, food production. And we know now from like, um, you know, the, the mass uh, flooding event we've had um, recently, but also, you know, the other flooding events we've had in terms of food security um, and how that and what we can do on a local basis to actually help people um, to build those skills and support them to produce at least some of their own food. So they're less vulnerable to those kind of extreme weather events um, that we're having with climate change. Yeah. And, you know, that you know that you can. It's not like it's this unknown thing that if you yeah. need to build it up really rapidly you've got the skills to do it and the community networks yeah. to make it happen yeah yeah you mentioned absolutely. climate change as well and I and I I was meant to ask you before when we were talking about the bees about what are you seeing as sort of the impact and the long-term impact on climate of climate change and also just bee health around the world in general what are you seeing at the at the trends and what can we do educationally to 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 make a difference in this? Yeah, look, it's, it's really tricky. Um, aside from the kind of uh, changes in uh, flowering patterns um, and, you know, budding of a lot of our, um, which would um, core kind of um, forage species that you would once be, you know, feel, feel fairly confident about their go-to location to, you know, for this particular type of honey, that that's all changing. And that, um, and that, um, and that collective memory and understanding about when trees used to flower and when they flower now and the changes in the climate are really making it difficult and challenging to read um, the trees. So that's why knowing, you know, having an understanding about botany is just so um, really important if you're a beekeeper, um, but also other kind of aspects like, um, so in our current climatic, climatic La Nina kind of cycle at the moment, we've been in it for the last three years. As a beekeeper, there's um, some pests and diseases that thrive on uh, high humidity. So that's causing an impact as well. So there's um, some diseases like um, uh, chalk brood, for instance, um, which is not really been an issue so much for us in Southern Victoria before. Um, and small hive beetle is becoming much more prevalent and that's directly related to the, the kind of the humidity levels. Um, so, yeah, we need to be constantly um, adapting to the, the kind of climate cycle and being able to understand what, how that might have an impact with our bees um, and then trying to kind of adapt as best we can to try and overcome some of those issues. So I guess... Um, in terms of what people can be doing in their backyards, what are the sorts of plants that you encourage people to put in? What kind of pollinator plants do you want people to start planting more of around the cities where you are, at least anyway, because I know yeah. it's going to be different everywhere. But, yeah. What yeah, would look, recommend? I think um, in, in general we say diverse. We need diversity. We need greater diversity um, and um, greater diversity of kind of pollinator-friendly plants general principles around, um, you know, allowing your veg garden to go to seed. So that you've got the flowering, you've got the beautiful flowers, and you've also got the benefit of, you know, the seeds. 
um, later on, but allowing for um, your flowers just to, I guess my message would be maybe more about just relax a bit, just relax, let the weeds, you know, if they're not causing a significant issue for you, let, let some of them kind of, you know, kind of proliferate, not so they get totally out of control, but um, yeah, to, to allow your garden to relax and breathe a bit. And just um, be a bit we, rewilded possibly. Yeah. So we've recently completely rewilded our front garden, which um, which our front garden was very much the 19 late 80s kind of um, uh, kind of you know weeping type trees. Um, and yeah, last year we completely rewilded that, and now it's just really all um, Australian native trees. We've got some magnificent banks here. Um, flowering at the moment, which I'm really surprised about. Sweet area, you know, all your casuarinas, all your Australian native um, uh, plants are generally really good for both European and Australian native bees, which um, which is what our hope was to be able to attract more Australian native bees back to our garden yeah. um, because they're often forgotten about. And um, yeah, they are like really useful pollinators as well, much like flies and moths and other insects <laughs> as well. So I do like my insects. Like, so. <laughs> well, it's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess just as a, a kind of a, a wrap up sort of question is if someone wanted to get a, a hive in their gut, what would be your advice to them before they started? You mentioned about like finding a good space before, but yep. what, are, what like a checklist before yeah. you go ahead and um, bring in bees into your spot? Yeah, look, if you wanted to be rigorous um, and, and go through a process, I'd recommend that uh, if you can make contact with your local beekeeping club or a local beekeeper to actually um, get up close and personal to actually establish whether you feel comfortable being around 20,000 bees buzzing around you. Maybe not quite so many 20,000, but lots and hundreds and hundreds of bees buzzing around you because we sometimes find that people are extremely... Um, um, motivated, very enthusiastic, really want to keep bees. And yet when they have their first experience, um, they, they're a little bit, it kind of freaks them out of having a lot of insects around, around you. So that would be, get, you know, get with somebody else, find somebody else that you can go and just put it, put a veil on, put some gloves on and just have that first initial experience so that you can determine whether or not this is going to be a good pathway for you. If you find it's not, there are so many other things that you can do. And one of those is what we just talked about in terms of like planting diverse, you know, Australian native um, shrubs, species, um, exotics as well. Um, letting your, you know, your veg garden go to seed, so it flowers, all those kind of things. Um, there's other things you can do if you're still passionate about bees and wanting to help insects and Australian native bees. There's other things that you can do. You don't have to become a beekeeper as such. What, but, what about native bees as well? Like, do you have much um, focus of that as well and what you're doing, creating native bee habitat? Or? Yeah, we just uh, not so much in um, your European honeybee when we're talking about European honeybees. Although we're always trying to make sure that people are also aware that we have Australian native bees. Um, in this part of um, Victoria and in kind of our local context, we have some really fantastic Australian native bees like blue banded bees and cuckoo bees and uh, reed cutter bees and a, and a whole raft of different Australian native bees, but they often get over, overshadowed and overlooked in preference of a honeybee. Um, so, yeah, creating habitat, once again, that kind of, you know, Australian native, find out what's, um, you know, kind of your local species um, and um, Sometimes the bee hotel is not the best way to go, um, although they are excellent for attracting um, um, native wasps, great for native wasp habitat, uh, because most of the Australian native bees that we have that are in this part of um, Victoria are non-colonising um, bees, so they're solitary bees, so they actually don't come together in that kind of bee hotel kind of phenomena. Um, and that they're ground dwelling bees. So if people ask, I generally say, well, you know, leave a patch of your backyard abandoned um, um, and just, you know, just just leave it. And you might find that you, you have some Australian native bees move in. 
ground dwelling. Yeah. Is. So yeah. do they burrow in or yes. do they just oh, Yes. Okay. Yeah, they do. So how yeah. deep do they go? Do they just um not terribly deep and they don't um they're not there for an extended period of time, but it's this phenomenon that people think that um well, first of all, that people think that they're colonizing this far south. They're not. So, you know, north of Sydney, you get the magnificent stingless bees, um, sugar bag bees, which is just fantastic. And I'd, you know, be great to actually have that, but we're not, that's not our space down here. Um, but yeah, they're just uh, the males, you'll often see the male blue banner bee roosting on like a twig or a piece of grass um <clears throat> they're just amazing to watch as well yeah very hard to photograph yeah <laughs> they're so much faster than a european honeybee yeah so <clears throat> they're really difficult to get a picture of <laughs> yeah well thank you so much for sharing about all of this it's absolutely fascinating and i you know i can hear the enthusiasm and I feel it deeply and I've been wanting for a long time too to get bees here in my place so you may well have just inspired me to to the next level get that going (laughs) there's a lot of my a lot of my friends and neighbors have and I'm I'm one of those recipients who gets lots of lovely honey and um (sighs) plant lots of the pollinators have all the diversity so that's that's been kind of an ally I'm an ally I'm an ally definitely and um yeah so that's fantastic I yeah I think I'd love to do it with my kids yeah it is it is something that really um is really great to do with your family yeah yeah Yeah. so where can people find out more about your programs and the work that you do and all the different bits and pieces of you know because I know that you have all uh, you have resources and you have information and and classes if anyone's in in your particular part of the world yeah, sure. Um, so you can uh, visit our website, um, which is www.backyardbeekeepingballarat.com.au or you can find us on uh, Facebook as Backyard Beekeeping Ballarat and Instagram, Backyard Beekeeping Ballarat again. Um, and, yeah, just um, take a look at some of our courses. We're now offering some courses in Geelong as well. Oh, great. Um, so our micro business is slightly extended this year to, to Geelong. Um, so, um, yeah, if anybody wants any further information about beekeeping or how to connect with their local beekeeping club, we can certainly put them in touch. Yeah, great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so very much for joining me on this special Urban Agriculture Month uh, podcast special. And um, it's just been fascinating and I'm really excited to to dive into more of that concept of hive mind and exploring you know how we explain yeah. systems thinking through yes. being a beekeeper i think that's absolutely fascinating <laughs> it is i love it <laughs> thanks amanda thanks Morag. <laughs>